Now, in our first story, the opposition NDC is demanding the immediate dissolution of the MIDA board, the resignation of the Minister for Finance and Energy um, for what it describes as causing financial loss to the state. Addressing the press on government's decision to terminate the PDS contract, General Secretary of the party, Isiadun Ketia, accused the MPP of um, putting together an agenda to misappropriate the $22 billion assets of ECG. According to Ms. Anketia, quote, there's too much corruption in the DNA of the finance minister, Ken Oforiata. The vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Alhaji, um, Alhaji Mahmoud Baumia, and president, Kofado, unquote. Here are excerpts of his address. The U.S. government has been minded to protect its $500 million grant contributed by the taxpayers of the United States of America to Ghana. The U.S. government and Ghanaians have not forgotten Kenofurata's letter of 27th March 2019, which sought to Nicodemusly restructure the Ghanaian shareholding in PDS for the benefit of his cronies. We have also not forgotten President Akufuado's trip to Angola and France, and the secret meetings he held with EDF and Anadia SA, respectively. Additionally, we know of the trip by a large government delegation led by Minister of Energy Peter Amehu to the Philippines to meet with Meraco, interestingly, a company he himself has cited for defrauding Ghana. It is these underhand dealings that have generated mistrust between the U.S. government on the one hand and the Ghanaian government on the other, thereby jeopardizing the whole power compact. It is also the reason why the good people cannot, the good people of Ghana, cannot trust the selfish, greedy, and corrupt Akufuado government to fix this PDS mess. Ladies and gentlemen, in his latest letter, Ken Ophuriata proposes the use of a restrictive tendering process to replace PDS. This is laughable, and we want to say that it is not an option that Ghanaians and the MCC should even consider. And our answer is no, no, no. We have already heard various communicators appealing to our nationalist instincts as a party in opposition to come ar around with government to protect the interests of Ghana. Let those communicators advise the MPP government to come around us to protect the interests of Ghana. Because we are in the interest of protecting the interests of Ghana, and they are not. Now, on the other hand, Director of Communications at the Ministry for Energy, Nana Damwa, has admitted government's decision to terminate the PDS agreement does not sit well with all parties involved and could bring along some sanctions to the country. Speaking on the Super Morning Show with me today, Nana Damwa indicated the Millennium Challenge Corporation could deprive Ghana of other aspects of the compact as a result of the termination of the deal. That notwithstanding, the state has in all processes ensured the protection of state assets. We all need to also understand that this decision to terminate this, cons uh, what you call it, this agreement, does not sit very well with all the, the stakeholders involved. And we may be penalized as a it country. It does not? It doesn't sit well with everybody. Who? Um, if you study the documents carefully, you may realize that the MCC may not be too pleased. Yeah. Yeah. With, with the decisions that we have made to... Yeah. to, to so the NCC disagrees with this decision? Yeah. Well, 
so far as we know, they are not very um, pleased with the, decision, you know? with the decision to, <laughs> to, to, to terminate this, this decision, uh, this, this uh, point. And all I'm seeking to say, all I'm seeking to say is that we may be penalized in two formats. And for example, the MCC could decide to deobligate the remaining $190 million out of the $498 million. It could also announce that Ghana is no longer eligible for the regional compact because of the so called failure at that stage if they have deobligated the $190 million. They could say that we are no longer eligible for Compact 3. Compact 3, if we qualify, m would come in very handy because you realize that we have excess capacity issues mm -hmm. and the evacuation of that power, if we're able to sort our issues with uh, competitiveness, may help us uh, in being able to recoup some of the losses that we have. So there could be some very serious uh, so penalties. Explain measures. the compact. Now, former Deputy Energy Minister John Ginapo, however, wants due diligence must be done in the process of the termination of the compact to save the state from any devastating losses. He called for patience by all stakeholders in the process. When you go through this process and you face such a major issue, the least you do is to rush into doing things. Let's step back as a country, let's consult further, let's build consensus and determine how we can manage this problem. We have the men. You've just heard Dr. Rekubribe, you've heard my uncle, uh, Mr. Gentua. There are a lot of people, look, if we bring everybody on board mm. and we are transparent, open, and sincere to the people of Ghana, we will resolve this challenge. Now, energy expert Kwame Jantua also called for a total review of the termination process, as well as the persons who will be taking over from PDS. Looking at the, the, the time scale, if we say we've terminated PDS, does that mean that we've eradicated everything they have? Because okay. we should know that the systems that are running are meters. The systems that are running the things that PDS was supposed to handle, the software is still PDS. So who is going to handle that? Is it ECG? And if it's ECG, are they familiar with these mm. systems? Mm. Is any member of PDS still going to be around to help run it? Okay. If they are, who's going to pay them? So all these questions need to be answered. But yet again, the time scale we've given to 31st December, I think government should go back to MCC and try and negotiate a longer period so that we can do this thing properly. Away from power issues, the Textile Workers Union has questioned government's decision to sidestep the Textile Piracy Task Force to effect arrests of smugglers. This follows the arrest of three women by the National Security Secretariat for attempting to smuggle pirated textiles from Togo into Ghana. General Secretary of the Textile Workers Union, Abraham Kumsen, believes a task force is better placed to do effective surveillance and arrest. He therefore does not understand why government is assigning the role to another body to execute. It's not a work of the national security to do this job singularly. That's why in 2010, the task force was put in place to make sure that the surveillance will be you know, uh, intensified and this arrest could be done without creating anything. But you see, I, I listened to the, the woman who was arrested and the way she was uh, explaining herself, uh, I don't think that, you see, just February this year, when the head of state, the president, addressed parliament, he specifically stated, and please, if you allow me to, to, to quote the president himself, he said, Mr. Speaker, our local textile industry has been struggling for years. And many textile companies have indeed gone under. We have decided to give it a major stimulus to help put it on a strong footing. Only the report has been designated as a single entry corridor for importation of textile prints. Only the report. So not even only the pirated print, but any textile, if it is not being brought in commercial quantity, maybe one piece or two pieces, that may not create any problem for us. But if we are bringing this goods in quantity, quantity like what we are seeing, 
It is not right. That is not an approved entry point. And so the, the children allow it. The task force will have six or whether the design is going to be it or not. They will sit or send them to the Ministry of Trade for them to decide as to how to, you know, uh, dispose of it. So me, what they are doing, the national security will not be able to to to, to perform to the expectation of the local manufacturers. The lab on your news today to roads now and the Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Asementa is blaming the opposition NDC for the bad roads in the region. He says the opposition party has no more right to question the NPP government it left with the challenge of unresolved huge debt at the roads ministry to fix the situation. He was addressing party members at the NPP Regional Women's Conference in Kumasi. The NDC must shut up if they don't have anything good to offer. They are the cause of bad roads in Ashanti region. They left huge debt at the road ministry without constructing the roads. Most of the contractors were not paid during the NDC era. Now, anytime you pay them, their bankers debit at source, so it is almost impossible to proceed with work as expected. My source tells me government has not been paying contractors for the period between 2011 and 2016. If they had paid contractors, we wouldn't have been plagued with such poor roads in Ashanti region. Yet, these same people will turn and accuse MPP government has not been paying contractors. NDC has nothing good to offer Ghanaians. All the major social interventions are the fruit of NPP. Now, still on the subject, traditional authorities of Insakina and adjoining communities have issued a two week ultimatum to President Ekufuado to fix the Ablekuma Insakina road failure, uh, of which will force them to embark on a demonstration. The road, according to the people, has caused miscarriages and respiratory infections among locals due to successive government's failure to at least put bitumen on the road. Addressing a news conference on the shoulders of the road at Oduman, the traditional authorities of about five communities and their subjects threaten to abstain from the 2020 elections if the road is not given a permanent fix. Latif Idris has more. We are looking at angry faces, red headbands, red t-shirts, frustrated individuals. You can call it drama what some of the people are doing here. They are literally lying in the mini ponds that have been created on the road to demonstrate to leadership that not enough work has been done to give the people some respite after years of traveling on what is rather a trap instead of a road network. The people over the years have demonstrated but very little improvement or attention, I must say, has been given to the road. So today, in the past, what we've had is the youth of this community embarking on demonstrations to drum home the concern of the larger majority of the population here. But let's start with the Secretary of the Coalition to tell us exactly 
what the concern is here. You give us your name first. And uh, Nikwa Chekwoti, Secretary to the Coalition. Our road network in these five communities that we mentioned in our press statement has deteriorated over the past years. We have prompted the DC, the MCE for a longer time and nothing has been done for us. They redrew the contractor who was working on this road since 2016 and nothing has been done about the road. Currently, as we are standing, we need the road to be fixed. We don't want any reshaping of the road. We need a third road to aggravate our situation. We don't want anything to be done which will warrant the plight that we are still facing. We want a fixed road, nothing more, nothing less. And we have advised ourselves, if we don't hear anything from the government, in the next two weeks, we'll go on massive demonstration, even more than what is being done in Hong Kong currently. Okay. Some frustrated residents there. Now, Latif is still with them as they head towards Amasaman to present a petition to the municipal chief executive. Latif, what's the latest from the demonstration? All right, Daniel, the latest is that the chiefs who have come together to form a coalition have headed to the municipal assembly at Amasaman to present a petition to the MCE. Uh, that is what is happening now, and the people have all gone back home because this, we are told, isn't a demonstration. It was a press conference, but it turned out to be a mini demonstration of a sort. The main demonstration, if they do not see work on the road starting in two weeks, that is when they say they will embark on a massive demonstration that's within be more than what is currently happening in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, um, Latif Idris, for joining us with that quick update. Away from that story, Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Bin Saleh has cautioned members of the newly inaugurated Regional Election Security Task Force not to allow their political differences to make them pitch tent against each other in the performance of their duties. He urged them to be objective in the line of their duty to enable them gain the confidence and trust of the people. Dr. Ben Saleh gave the caution during the inauguration of the Upper West Election Security Task Force in WA. John News' Upper West Region correspondent Rafik Salam reports. Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Ben Saleh noted that the inauguration of the Election Security Task Force could not have come at a better time than when the country has two major polls to conduct within a year, starting with a referendum and the district level and unit committee elections on December 17. Dr. Binsali therefore called on aspirants of the various elections to conduct clean campaigns which are issue-based and not laced with insults. As the political temperature rises, it is the prayer of every Ghanaian that we conduct our campaign in a civil manner devoid of insults, castigation, and attacks on personalities. We should let our campaigns be issue-oriented than insults. Let us refrain from outrances that can spark controversies in the country. We, the people of this region, can only have peace if we decide to do so by conducting ourselves well from now, during, and after the December 2020 general election. The membership of the Regional Election Security Tax Force comprised of heads of security agencies in the region, division and districts, regional and district electoral officers, and chaired by the Upper West Police Commander of the Ghana Police Service, DCOP Francis Nyako. The function of the task force include, one, ensure the overall security of the elections, two, secure the safe transport and storage of ballot materials, that is, papers and boxes, at polling station. Three, ensure peace at polling station on election day. Four, see to the smooth settlement of complaint. Five, ensure the RSM prosecution of election offenders. Six, identify trouble prone areas. He urged members of the committee to be objective in their line of duty 
in order to gain the confidence and trust of the people. You should not allow your political difference make you pitch tents against each other in the course of the performance of your duties. Upper West Regional Director of the Electoral Commission, Ali Osman Adamu, welcomed with open arms the inauguration of the tax force. Elections are very volatile and we must not underrate it. Therefore, having all these security men here, I'm sure this year's this level election and the referendum will be taken very seriously so that we don't have any security issues before, during and after the elections and then the referendum. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wa Now, three years after Parliament approved a $35 million um, facility for the construction of the Obechebi Lamte interchange, President Ekofado is cutting short today for the construction to start. The three tier project, when completed, will ease traffic congestion in that area, estimated to record some 8,000 vehicles moving there during peak hours. Presidential correspondent Elton Brobe joins me for more on this project. Elton, what are the key features that this will have upon completion? Hello, Elton. Right, um, we would re-establish contact with Elton John Brobe, after which we'll get an update on exactly what's happening at the commissioning, or sorry, the sword cutting of the Obeche Bilamte Interchange Project. Elton is with us. Hello, Elton. Yes, Daniel. Great. Brief us. What are the key features about this um, interchange? All right, so that, so this, this, is, interchange this, I mean. this is just the first phase of the project. Remember that in 2006, Parliament approved a loan of $39 million for this particular project. Now, the government says that they have only been able to secure $35 million from the amount uh, to, to start with the first phase. The entire project will cost the nation $135 million. So this first phase, which government uh, has asked for the work to start, uh, we will we'll witness interchange between the graphic road, Kamesi Malam Road, and the church here, flyover for the ring road west from the Royal House Chapel, all the way to the central bus at the top end. So, this, this, this has been the pleasure of the that the first phase, the first phase will be done uh, within 18 months so that government can go on to the two of our funds to enable it to complete the entire project. So, what just happened is the first start for the start of the first phase, which is just uh, be dedicated to the uh, the arterial road within the enclave. Elton, have we been told by authorities why we need an interchange at Obeche Bilamte Circle? Well, for those who use this road, and, and, and perhaps those who are familiar with this particular area, uh, vehicular traffic at peak hours is quite unbearable. And that's the justification government has provided uh, in its press to start a flyover in this particular area. So that people who are using the graphic road all the way to Kaneshi, all the way to Seiko, and all the way to Abutokan will have that comfort to drive to once this project is completed. I remember that the entire project will cost 135. What they are doing today is just the first thing, which will not come with the flyover or come with the underground lane. Elton, thank you very much for that update. Right, we move from that story and headmistress of St. Mary's Senior High School, Grace Mansa Ishen says, the provision of infrastructure for the school is not solely the responsibility of government as she admonishes all students of the school in the country to provide support. Speaking as a commissioner of an infirmary provided by the 1979-year group of the school, she said the mini clinic is a boost for the health and academics of the students. Maxwell Agbagba has more. Some members of the 1979-year group singing the school's anthem during the morning mass before the commissioning of the infirmary. Girls prefect of the school, Stephanie Safu Edu says, previously, students who were ill or recuperating had to use the office of the senior house mistress as a resting place. We are so much excited. It was quite hectic. We had to move from school to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. After that, it's either you are sent home 
or when you come, you sleep in the senior house mistress's office. Headmistress of the school, Grace Mansa Ishen, is urging old students of senior high schools in the country to support government's efforts with the provision of infrastructure. I believe old students are a major stakeholder in assisting the school. The government is doing its part, but it cannot do it alone. This is my opinion. And over here, I would really say that Smogans have done very well, marvelously well. So many projects have been initiated by them and completed. Smogans took care of the gate that you find, the main entrance to the school. Currently, they've given us the state of the art infirmary. They are also constructing an e-library at their gift at the 70th anniversary to the school. I would say that all students should help, and already Smoga is on the path. President of the St. Mary's Old Girls Association Smoga 1979-year group, Caroline Stevens, has been talking about what motivated the group to provide an infirmary for the school. So the school has a lot of infrastructure challenges. So we felt that fulfilling this um, infrastructure need will be the best gift to give back to our, our alma mater. Member of the 1981-year group and teacher at the school, Benedicta Nuchuga, has been recounting her fondest memories as a student. She has been sharing the story behind the Accra Academy and St. Mary's relationship, popularly known as a Kasma. Accra Accra had their school campus at Accra, and then they had their boarding house at uh, Mamprobi, and then we didn't have a wall. So any time they were driven to school, our girls would wave them, and then they knew when they would be returning, wait for them, and wave them back. So that is how... It started before they went to Kadeshi, and it has stuck. So the, the, the feeling is deep. Akasma, Obawa. Her colleague, Na Ashifia Brasekwe, has also been sharing some of her best moments at St. Mary's SHS at Kolibu. St. Mary's, I remember my first headmistress, Sister Ruth. We call her Ruth Tutu. But when she's coming, you say, Atala is coming. And you know, the way she speaks, you get a crowd. And then we used to be taken. But if she catches you, you are in big trouble. It's a carbon, we call him carbon you, carbon you. Yes. He teaches us music. And he likes my voice because I have the baritone. You know, he switches to tenor before he realizes I've gone to bass because the voice is big. You know, he have the family voice. But Mia Haji, Mia Haji, Mia Haji, yes, two, two, two. Her 